I'm Lynn Packer. This is my video about penny stock fraud in Utah. Among others, I'll talk about penny stock connections to Governor Gary Herbert, Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox, and Attorney General Sean Reyes. You're probably aware of Utah's reputation as the stock fraud capital of the United States. It originated before Utah was even a state in the late 1800s. It's connected with its stock exchange that traded mostly gold and silver mine securities. It was boosted by the uranium penny stock boom of the 1950s. And today it's still deeply rooted in its penny stock origins, also augmented with multi-level marketing, telemarketing, and door-to-door -door sales frauds. Utah's fraud pandemic is ongoing. There have been hundreds of reports about Utah's fraud reputation. Here are a few headlines. Here's one that refers to Utah as the sewer of the securities industry. So, is Utah penny stock fraud back? Or did it ever leave? Hint, it never left. Utah news media quit covering it. Utah law enforcement quit prosecuting it. Utah continues to be a sanctuary, a protected haven for penny stock swindlers. Just this past April, the Securities and Exchange Commission put out an investor alert on pandemic-related fraud. I'll just read a few of the lines. If you're considering investing in a company, especially in a microcap or penny stock, be skeptical of claims that products or services can prevent detect, or treat COVID-19. Scammers are also promoting rumors on social media, on online bulletin boards, and in chat rooms. False claims about a company's products and services are sometimes part of a pump and dump scheme, and that microcap stocks may be particularly vulnerable. Over the years, I've done quite a bit of reporting about penny stock fraud, like this uh, cover story in Utah Holiday in 1989, Another, a year later, more recently in 2017, a report about Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes' involvement with a penny stock company. But let's go back to the beginning, to the Salt Lake Stock and Mining Exchange in the late 1800s. It was located downtown, where stocks were traded over the counter. Here's what a trading sheet looked like. The companies listed on the exchange tended to be speculative oil and mining penny stocks. Here's how one writer in the 1950s described it. Salt Lake City, that citadel of conservative Mormonism, became the gambling capital of the world. Las Vegas took a back seat during the big boom in penny uranium stocks. There were more shares traded over the counter in Salt Lake in a day than were handled by the New York Stock Exchange. Governor Jay Bracken Lee tried to restore sanity by warning people to beware of uranium stocks. <laughs> the next day, penny over-the-counter sales spurted to a new high. In 1989, Congress held hearings on penny stock fraud. John Baldwin, Utah Securities Division Director, testified. He said a 50-state study by his group showed people who invest in penny stocks have a 90% chance of losing money. Penny stock swindles, he said, are the number one threat of fraud and abuse facing small investors in the United States. His organization survey found that Americans lose an estimated $2 billion each year as a result of penny stock schemes, what he called the shadowy netherworld of U.S. equity markets. After Baldwin testified in 1989, Utah remains a cesspool of penny stock scams. It's still infested with penny stock promoters. One study found pump and dump schemes cost American investors between three and $10 billion annually. It was done by James Cox, a securities law professor at Duke. He also said we ought to just shut down the penny stock market. It's a sad, sad part of our economy. After about 1990, the Utah press, for the most part, simply quit covering penny stock fraud. Well, worse, often doing stories that aided and abetted pump-and-dump schemes. So today, how do you define penny stocks? Here's a chart that shows various levels of stocks, and penny stocks are way down there. They're stocks that trade over the counter. They say the OTC bulletin board 
or on the pink sheet. There are stocks that are priced below $5 a share and companies with a market capitalization of less than $300 million. And often they will sell for just cents and sometimes for fractions of a cent. They're also known as microcap, even nanocap companies. How does penny stock fraud work? Swindlers form a penny stock company with as many as a billion low price shares. Usually it's in the millions. But the promoters control most of the shares themselves or through nominees, that is people that they know and control. They stimulate sales, pump up the price of stocks with false online messages, spam email, press releases, and cold calls. Then the crooks dump, that is sell their shares, often reaping millions of dollars. The sell-offs drive down prices, leaving unwary investors with near worthless or worthless stock. I've mentioned the term pump and dump a few times. What you want to do is look at a stock chart's peaks and valleys. Here's a chart that shows one peak and one valley where it's first pumped up with postal mailers, like I said, spam emails, cold calls, PR news wires and press reports, and then it's dumped. But here's an actual chart, and there's usually lots of peaks and valleys. This process can be repeated, where with the peaks, the stock price is driven up, and then the insiders sell, dump their shares, and leave investors with worthless stock. If you really want to understand the penny stock thing, I've got a homework assignment for you. Watch the movie Wolf of Wall Street. Here's a short clip. Okay, great. Well, reason for the call today, John, is something just came across my desk, John. It is perhaps the best thing I've seen in the last six months. If you have 60 seconds, I'd like to share the idea with you. You got a minute? Name of the company, Aerotine International. It is a cutting edge, high tech firm out of the Midwest awaiting imminent patent approval on a next generation of radar detectors that have both huge military and civilian applications. Now, right now, John, the stock trades over the counter at 10 cents a share. And by the way, John, our analyst indicator could go a heck of a lot higher than that. Your profit on a mere $6,000 investment would be upwards of $60,000. Jordan Belfort is the real wolf of Wall Street. Here's what his boiler room would have looked like. And there's a Utah connection. One of the earliest worthless stocks he pushed hardest was Hollywood's Ventura Entertainment Group, had the ticker symbol VEGG. At Ventura's 1986 beginning, Utah Security Division Director John Baldwin, I mentioned him before, expressed concern and warned the stock was a gamble. That same Ventura Entertainment Group bought Utah's Osmond Studios in 1989. It was located in Orem, and it's where the Donnie and Marie show was produced for several years. The penny stock company Ventura named Jimmy Osmond a director and president. Investors lost millions, the studio was shut down, Ventura Entertainment went under, and of course, Belfort went to prison. This caution, in Utah, you should disregard some penny stock movie stereotypes. Not all swindlers who pump up and manipulate stock prices are young college dropouts like in the movie Boiler Room, which is another penny stock movie. Take, for example, the Utah stock fraud Outnet, whose stock was manipulated by elite members of Utah society. The Outnet fraud is an example where perpetrators got a pass from the Utah news media and from prosecutors. The company marketed language translating software. The stock lost investors millions and was delisted to penny stock status. In 1993, the SEC found two prominent Utahns, a noted car dealer and a banker, had been manipulating stock prices. But neither was criminally charged. The Utah press barely mentioned what should have been a major story. With that background, I'll cut to the chase. This video is about corrupted Utah politicians, and it's based on the premise that no Utah agency, especially the Attorney General's office, should procure products or services from microcap companies. Penny stock public companies are inherently volatile. State officers should never endorse any procurements, especially those from fraud-ridden penny stock ventures. Even worse, 
if those procurements are made without bidding, that is, so sourced via no-bid contracts. Here are some of the key penny stocks I'm going to talk about. First for Governor Herbert and Lieutenant Governor Cox. Code Diagnostics. You'll notice that I include the trading symbol in case anybody wants to go online and look up more information about the companies. This company was trading at over $16 a share in June of this year, but just a few months earlier was trading at less than a dollar a share. Viva Ventures and NARCX. And for Attorney General Reyes, Twin Lab, Bertra, and Liberty Defense Holdings, plus NARCX as well. We start with Code Diagnostics. It's one of many penny stock companies that have purported remedies or solutions for COVID-19. It's a Utah publicly traded company. It originated from a penny stock shell and it's at risk of being delisted by NASDAQ. Code Diagnostics was purchased by Governor Herbert and Lieutenant Governor Cox through three Utah companies on no-bid contracts. So it was the double whammy, penny stock, no-bid contracts. The test is used by tech companies that have received more than $60 million in no-bid contracts to run testing systems in Utah and two other states. The three companies, and they're all part of uh, Test Utah, had no experience with lab testing. Code Diagnostics provides the test kits. Utah's contract should not have been sole source, no bid. More important, given Code Diagnostics penny stock roots and microcap status, it should not have even been asked to submit a request for proposal, an RFP, had the contract been open to bid. Utah officials should have investigated Code Diagnostics history with penny stock companies. Consider Dwight Egan, the company's chairman and co-founder. He made the alleged false claim that his code diagnostics tests were 100% accurate. And this is a quote from a lawsuit against the company. It said, during this time, and with a cloud of doubt hanging over the company's claims of accuracy, code diagnostics directors and officers have been rapidly exercising stock options for pennies per share, and immediately selling their shares into the market, reaping millions of dollars from the fraud inflated price of the stock. And it sounds like they're accusing them of uh, pumping and dumping. Goes on to say the officers and directors, knowing the truth of the company's products and its future prospects, are taking their profits at a cost to the public markets before the company inevitably becomes a penny stock once more. Egan had been previously involved with a penny stock company, Broadcast International. He co-founded and served as CEO from 84 to 95. It had been originally launched in 1982 with Merrill Osmond. It was another Osmond deal that didn't pan out. There was a reverse merger in 2004 with a new ticker symbol. Shares sold through European boiler rooms. It's now defunct. Uh, it was selling for about $5 a share in 2011, but for $0.16 cents a share in 2013. Another Utahan, Reed Benson, a Utah attorney, is Code Diagnostics CFO. He was vice president and general counsel at Broadcast International. He was terminated in 2008 after Spanish regulators charged him in a case against one of the boiler rooms that had been selling Broadcast International shares. And he's been involved with lots of other uh, penny stocks. I won't even bother to read them all. Suffice it to say, there are a lot of them. As I said, press releases are a key way of pumping up stock prices, especially if it can indicate a connection with somebody famous or a government agency. Code Diagnostics press release said it was working with Cox's team and went on to say was also working closely with the governor's office. Let's take a look at Code Diagnostics stock chart. Last year it was sailing along with the stock price under a dollar. It was in danger of being delisted. All of a sudden COVID-19 hits and it takes advantage. Are there any signs of pumping and dumping, that is spikes and valleys? Here are possible pumps and dumps. And recently the stock was still above $17.
Code Diagnostics is not Governor Herbert's only involvement with a penny stock company. There is Viacor, associated with the company Viva Ventures. Governor Herbert invited Viacor's Matt Nicosia to present at the Governor's 2019 Energy Summit and to go on a Utah trade mission. What did the press release say? said that the company had been asked by World Trade Center Utah, in partnership with the Governor's Office of Economic Development, to participate in an official state trade mission led by Governor Gary R. Herbert. Goes on to say, we have also enjoyed an excellent working relationship with the state of Utah with our activities in eastern Utah. That's sort of like manna from heaven to connect to a government entity. Did the press releases boost stock prices? Let's look at the chart. Right after the press release, the stock price skyrocketed up to $1.19 a share. After that, it dropped down to about 31 cents a share. Governor Herbert's connection to Viva Ventures takes state endorsement of a penny stock to a rather startling level. The news media, regulators, pay no attention. Let me add just a little fun fact. Vivacor's stock is hawked by presidential advisor Stephen Schwartzman's Blackstone Commodity Group. That's the same company that bought Utah's Vivint for $2 billion in 2012. I don't want to forget to mention that Governor Herbert's and Lieutenant Governor Cox's 2016 campaign co-chairman was Doug Foxley. Foxley had close penny stock ties. He co-owned the penny stock-centered Crossit Company Incorporated. He chaired former Governor Norm Bangeter's campaign that accepted penny stock in-kind donations. And he was senior advisor to the 2020 Huntsman for Governor campaign. Then there's Governor Herbert's Division of Housing Director, who was Gordon D. Walker. He was deeply involved with penny stock ventures such as Marina Capital and American Insulock. He was associated in business with penny stock promoter Stephen Stutter and one of Walker's investors who lost $100,000 in an alleged gold mining scam was former Utah GOP chairman and Republican National Committee chairman Dick Richards. I think I was the last reporter to interview Richards about his investment loss before he died. Let's talk about two other politicians who have tight penny stock connections, former Utah Senator Orrin Hatch, and current U.S. President Donald Trump. While he was still Senator, Hatch helped hype penny stock company Razor Technologies and also secured federal subsidies for the company. Here he is at a groundbreaking for the company's geothermal plant that they named the Hatch plant. Later, as the company shift gears, he drove a Razor prototype 100 mile per gallon Hummer on Capitol Hill. That was in 2009 and was heavily covered by the press. Razor Technologies went bankrupt in 2011, but it did spin off privately held Via Motors. That company also competes with Utah's billion dollar Nicola Corporation. At least one of Senator Hatch's current penny stock company connections is with Predictive Technology Group. It's another one of those Utah COVID-19 related penny stock companies. He sits on Predictive's board of directors. In April, the SEC temporarily halted predictive stock trading. The suspension came after the company touted production of a rapid test for COVID-19. It was part of an SEC crackdown on companies promoting unproven products relating to the coronavirus outbreak. The SEC raised questions regarding the accuracy and adequacy of information in the marketplace concerning the company. This chart indicates predictive share price volatility with lots of peaks and valleys. It's been as high as 460 a share. Each of those peaks could represent a pump. And it's currently around 42 cents a share. Was predictive CEO Brad Robinson's track record something Hatch was aware of or should have been aware of before he joined the board? Robinson was alleged to have falsely claimed that a Chinese manufacturing partner received Chinese government approval to distribute its antibody tests. The company was previously sued over claims of non-compliant marketing of a medical cholesterol-lowering algae water product. 
is accused of falsely stating that one of his products would be pitched by Dr. Oz on television and by the Gates Foundation. And he was previously charged by the SEC over allegations of issuing false press releases. Sounds something like alleged pumping and dumping. Before he was elected to the Senate, Hatch was not unfamiliar with penny stock ventures. In the 1970s, he defended accused swindlers. The most infamous was George Norman. Norman promoted penny stocks, was known for his lavish estate in Holiday, Utah, and for reportedly entertaining celebrities like Bob Hope and Lucille Ball. In late 1970, Norman was convicted of bank fraud, but he escaped in a Cadillac he borrowed from a judge that he knew and was recaptured two decades later. His son lives in Salt Lake City and deals in, what else, penny stocks. Utah Senator Mitt Romney, Hatch's successor, has his own connection to penny stocks. It's through his brother-in-law, Roderick Davies. Davies campaigned for Romney. He chaired a secret 2012 committee to deflect anti-Mormon bias against Romney when Romney ran for president. And Davies was deep into penny stocks. For example, ends and services, and another that went public via a reverse merger with the 1954 uranium stock shell. Davies was twice accused of fraudulent dealings. Donald Trump is the next politician on my list. One of his penny stock ventures was Trump Magazine. It was a pump and dump penny stock scam that involved a short-lived publication bearing his name. Ivanka Trump was on the first cover. Shares were sold to the public through several misleading practices like cold calling and distributing newsletters falsely asserting that Premier that's the name of the publisher, was readying a deal with Disney to produce a Trump cartoon. PPBL, that's the ticker symbol, opened at around a dollar a share. Soon the share price was nearly half that. In early 2007, the stock price crashed to mere pennies. By August 2007, Trump ended his licensing agreement. Premier went bankrupt, having lost $7 million in a single year. Then there's Trump's penny stock oil venture. The Trump Oil Corporation was a Vancouver, Canada-based company. It involved the typical myriad reverse mergers and acquisitions. It was suspected of a price manipulation scheme. A 1994 reference to the Vancouver Stock Exchange called it a place for shams, swindles, and market manipulations. A Trump tweet pumped up another company's penny stock share price 239%. Workhorse Group focuses on electric vehicles, and since August 2018, its shares struggled to break $1.50. In a May 8, 2019 tweet, the president said that General Motors CEO Mary Barra told him that GM would sell its Lordstown manufacturing plant to Workhorse. The tweet ended up crashing the company's website. It sparked so much interest that a circuit breaker triggered a pause in trading. A factory visit by Vice President Mike Pence in June pumped up stock prices again. A press account said Pence announced that Workhorse Group had secured financing to buy GM's factory in Lordstown, Ohio to build electric trucks. After General Motors idled the small car factory in March, Lordstown has become a hotbed issue for President Trump who built much of his electoral strategy on bringing back manufacturing to the Midwest. The stock chart shows Trump's and Pence's bumps. First, Trump's in 2019, and then the factory visit pushed stock prices even higher in June. Recently, the shares have traded around $19. Like father, like son, in 2011, Donald Trump Jr. worked for and owned shares in penny stock venture Macrosolve. It was a company some labeled as a patent troll, that is, making money by bringing patent infringement lawsuits. In 2012, Trump Jr. joined another penny stock company, this time SG Blocks Incorporated. He joined as a senior advisor for 1 million shares of stock. Another Trump penny stock tie, his longtime associate Lev Parnas. 
Ukrainian-born Parnas operated a penny stock brokerage that was shut down by regulators. He moved to Florida in 1995 and bounced around eight brokerages in less than four and a half years before buying his company and turning it into a penny stock pusher. His brokerage, Euro-Atlantic Securities, was shut down amid accusations it was a front for organized crime. And one of his stock examples, in 2006, he launched EdgeTech International. It took over a dormant, publicly traded Nevada-based company that had been formed to produce cholesterol-free cow's milk. Still another Donald Trump penny stock link, Rudy Giuliani's law firm. One press account said Giuliani Partners' client base is chock full of small and micro-cap stocks like Applied DNA. Applied DNA logged $35 million in losses from 2002 to 2004 and no revenue. Curiously, the company's penny stock has risen rapidly despite the company having no cash for operations and no customers, a CNN report said. Giuliani Partners would get $2 million in fees to advise the firm on marketing strategies for security and homeland defense products. I still haven't run out of Donald Trump penny stock connections. This time through Brad Parscale, his 2016-2020 campaign strategist. Parscale signed a $10 million deal to sell his digital marketing company to the Utah-connected penny stock company Cloud Commerce. He joined the board. He touted the stock. Utah and Andrew Van Noy is Cloud Commerce's CEO. He's a BYU graduate. He filed for bankruptcy in 2010. He was accused of selling unlicensed securities and using $100,000 of an investor's money for personal purposes. A previous cloud commerce executive, Jonathan Lay, pled guilty to securities fraud in 2016. I'd like to add this note about William Bifus. Bifus was a cloud commerce partner with Van Noy and Lay. His latest venture, Digital Locations Incorporated. It's a penny stock company that purportedly develops cell tower sites for the 5G revolution. Bifus convinced a University of Utah-related research project to experiment with his ventures app. As with virtually all other penny stock ventures, a press release ensued. Digital Locations June 22, 2020 press release refers to the University of Utah project. Did the press release affect share prices? On June 20th, shares were virtually worthless. After that, they skyrocketed to 21 cents a share. Then after that, it dropped to 2 cents a share. Is there any evidence the press release pumped up the stock price? This is a headline from a penny stock news site. Digital Locations, Inc. climbs into the tower by taking part in the 5G revolution. It said, we see that the approval for the application to study and further develop powder, that's the University of Utah project, could have led to a lot of confidence in the market. Where the stock closed yesterday at around four cents and opened at seven, it is currently worth 20 cents. This is an explosive increase of 375%. Now I'm shifting gears to talk about Utah's Fraud College. Putting it bluntly, Utah's Fraud College was a sham. Its co-founders were AG candidate Sean Reyes, he was a candidate for Attorney General at the time, and Securities Attorney Brent Baker. Its sponsor was APX Alarm Security Solutions Incorporated, now Vivint. Why wasn't it named Utah Anti-Fraud College? It was set up to teach Utahns how to avoid being swindled. But Sean Reyes shows no sign he's done anything to reduce Utah fraud since being elected Attorney General. Penny stock, multi-level marketing, and telemarketing scams still run rampant. And Brent Baker... He was an SEC attorney who prosecuted swindlers, but he's now a white-collar fraud defense attorney. Other than set up a sham fraud college, neither has pushed for legislation that would curtail penny stock, MLM, or telemarketing fraud. 
What about fraud college sponsor APX? It was accused of fraud. APX Alarm, a door-to-door -door sales company, was hit with numerous accusations of deceptive sales practices and fraud. The company, after refocusing and rebranding as Vivint Solar, was sued by New Mexico's Attorney General for fraud. Vivint officers and employees also were among the top donors to former Utah Attorneys General Mark Shirtliff and John Swallow. Vivint CEO Todd Patterson now endorses Sean Reyes for re-election, and he donated $50,000 to the Cox campaign. Sean Reyes took over where his predecessor, Mark Shirtliff, left off. Here are some of Shirtliff's penny stock connections. He plugged the penny stock company Copper King Mine. He befriended penny stock promoter Jeremy Johnson. And he joined with penny stock multi-level marketing guru Ron Johnson after he left office. Here's a little background on Sean Reyes. He may be Donald Trump's star sycophant. He was a Trump surrogate on the campaign trail in 2016. He was a finalist to chair Trump's Federal Trade Commission. He supported Trump's downsizing of Utah National Monuments. He applauded Trump's Brett Kavanaugh nomination. He called Trump's impeachment a sham and helped prepare the GOP senator's counterattack. He supported Trump's right to rescind DACA. He joined the Trump lawsuit to dismantle Obamacare, and he won Trump's endorsement for his 2020 AG re-election. Here's something I didn't expect. Reyes agrees Utah is the stock fraud capital. Is he speaking as a wolf in sheep's clothing? Go to his website. It's there. He asks, is Utah the fraud capital of the United States? Yes. Yes, we are. Now I'm going to begin showing you Reyes' numerous penny stock venture connections. I'll mark them like this. Here's the first. Reyes bought on a no-bid contract a police training simulator from a penny stock company. The brand name is Vertra. Reyes promotes it on the Attorney General's website, and he promotes it on a YouTube video. Reyes not only promotes Vertra on his website and YouTube, also promotes it at trade shows and conferences, like this police chief's conference. Let's look at Vertra's chart. In 2011, share prices hovered around $1.22. Then the Utah Attorney General buys Vertra. There are press releases. It shoots up to three thirty dollars a share in 2015. Then the Utah Attorney General gets the system, installs it, and heavily promotes it. The share price skyrockets to $6.02 a share in November 2016. Since then, it's dropped somewhat. Vertra is an Arizona company, but it had a Utah connection prior to selling its product to the Utah Attorney General. It was through Utah MBA Donna Moore, who was Vertra's chief financial officer. Moore had been connected to a long list of penny stock ventures. I won't bother to read all of them. Besides being a penny stock, how was Vertra sole sourced? A Utah Division of Purchasing Agent put a false statement in the sole source justification document that she apparently cribbed from a Vertra sales brochure. It points out that the Vertra product had been compared against a competitor's product, Milo Range, and that the latter came up lacking. Given the Vertra system's purported superiority with an optional feature that only Vertra had, there was no need to engage competitive bidding. Why did Reyes even get into police training? Was the system actually mostly for Operation Underground Railroad? That's a paramilitary group that goes around the world rescuing what it calls child sex slaves. In 2014, OUR's Tim Ballard told a reporter that he was meeting weekly with Reyes to establish an international child rescue laboratory in Salt Lake. He wanted to train how to track pornographers and traffickers and teach shooting skills. 
Here you see meeting with President Trump. Reyes penny stock connection number two, Utah State Senator Curtis Bramble. Bramble was Senate sponsor of the law that authorized Reyes to train police officers in use of force and to purchase and operate the Vertra system. Bramble himself had been named a director of a penny stock company, Medical Cannabis Payment Solutions. A February 2014 press release announced Bramble joining MPCS's board as chairman. Shortly thereafter, the penny stock company share prices skyrocketed. Medical Cannabis' stock chart tells the story. Near the time of the Bramble press release, the share price was about 16 cents. Right after, it shot up to 44 cents. In June of 2000, it dropped way down to less than a penny. Bramble is also a shareholder in the solid waste recycling company, New Lixo. New Lixo has a contract with the state of Utah. While New Lixo is not a penny stock company, it recently contracted to purchase eight plastic to oil recycle processors for $24 million from the penny stock company Plastic to Oil. Plastic to Oil has a history of alleged sham purchase agreements and fraud. Plastic to Oil share price jumped after its deal with New Lexo was announced to the public. Reyes Connection number three. He visits and promotes Twin Lab. That's an American four penny stock nutritional supplement manufacturer. Here he's seen at the tour. Naomi Whittle, the Twin Lab CEO, said, The rash of recent negative press is due to a lack of transparency in our industry. So when we had the opportunity to invite the Attorney General into our facility, I jumped all over that. After all, the regulators and the legislators are part of our ecosystem. Reyes's position as Attorney General was that these penny stock companies should self-regulate and not be prosecuted. He was quoted in the trade press, and I'm not making this up, to the extent you can self-regulate and flush out the bad actors, it certainly helps us because we have scarce resources. He said we'd rather not be chasing them down if we don't have to. And it certainly helps you all because you're not left with the taint of some of those bad actors. We deal with a lot of dark stuff in the Attorney General's office, it's so refreshing to take a break from all of that, be able to go out and see good, hardworking, productive companies that are providing jobs and contributing to the local economy. Were the Reyes Tour press releases and news articles part of the Twin Lab pump and dump scheme? Well, look at the chart and when the tour took place and what happened to stock prices. The Utah Twin Lab facility eventually shut down. Number four, Liberty Defense Holdings is a penny stock company that sells metal detectors. Reyes signed an MOU, a memo of understanding, and promoted the company. The press release said Liberty Defense signs MOU with the Utah Attorney General for testing of Hexwave. That's what they named the product. It was promoted on the Utah Attorney General website, and there was massive press coverage. Liberty Defense stock shot up right after Reyes's announcement. The Salt Lake Tribune bid on the press release and press conference and reported that Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes is partnering with Georgia-based Liberty Defense to test and promote a product that uses 3D imaging and artificial intelligence to detect concealed weapons on people in public spaces. The stock price shoots up after the report, and the questions are, are these pump and dump schemes, and are they abetted by Sean Reyes and the Utah Press? Of course, Liberty Defense highlights its partnership with Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes on its website. It even shows the Attorney General's seal. Number five the reyes Patey burge penny stock connection. Here's Aaron Patey and Sean Reyes on the mall in Washington, D.C. They were in Washington for the Trump inauguration. They're puffing on Curb brand essential oils diffusers. That's a 
product that Patey sells. And here's Aaron Patey and Mark Burge with President Trump. Mark Burge, Patey's partner, was involved with several penny stock companies. One example, he was previously with a Utah multi-level marketing company that was also a volatile penny stock company, Whole Living LLC. Whole Living, now defunct, claimed to have combined cutting-edge research with ancient wisdom to create dietary products based on biblical and Mormon scripture passages. In 2011, the Utah State Tax Commission filed felony tax evasion-related charges against Burge. They included alleged racketeering, communications fraud, unlawful dealing by a fiduciary, and failure to file proper tax returns. Reyes, Penny Stock Connection number 6. He promoted NARC X, a Utah company with strong penny stock ties. He touted it in a press conference and on his website, where it said they discussed implementing a statewide initiative using NARC X, that's an on site disposal system for opioids. I also want to mention that Governor Herbert and the Utah legislature also supported NARC X. I'll just uh, cite some lines from an online press release where Governor Herbert signed Senate Bill 29 into law and it tasks the Utah Attorney General's office with establishing a program. Also says that NARCX worked closely with Utah lawmakers on the bill. This involvement of elected politicians and state agencies with a penny stock company is truly jaw-dropping. The number seven connection with Paul Hutchinson, who was an honorary colonel for the Utah Attorney General's office, a finance chairman for the Sean Reyes AG campaign, and also a prepper, that's a, like a survivalist. Here he is saying with Reyes, here he is with Senator Romney, and here he is with his prepper mobile, a Hummer, Hutchinson Hawk, the worthless penny stock of the Utah Video Surveillance Company, Synergetic Technologies. A successor company, Hutchinson was no longer affiliated, was cited for a fraudulent pump and dump scheme. Number eight, Secure American Gold Exchange. Reyes was a director and in-house legal counsel for the company. Reyes collaborated with a man named Wayne Palmer. Palmer's Old Glory Minting Company and Reyes's Secure American Gold Exchange collaborated on gold deals and they teamed up to pass Utah's Legal Tender Act of 2011. The SEC shut down National Note and a bankruptcy receiver sued to recover $112,000 from Reyes's American Gold Exchange. The court had to enter a judgment against AGEC because Reyes had refused to pay the money. Palmer pled guilty to wire fraud, money laundering, and running a real estate Ponzi scheme. The SEC barred Palmer from trading in penny stocks. As I mentioned, before his guilty plea, Palmer had helped convince Governor Herbert to sign the Legal Tender Act that recognizes gold and silver coins as legal tender in Utah. The New York Times reported that the new law represents an extension of the notion of preparedness that is nurtured by Utah's powerful founding institution, the Mormon Church. Many of the law's supporters believe that federal government policies will soon bankrupt the government, sending inflation soaring. Owning gold and silver, they say, will help protect people. Old Glory Gold Exchange and Secure American co-sponsored Reyes's speeches at the Utah Monetary Summit in 2011 and 2014. Here you see Reyes addressing the group and he's holding up his liquid gold app that he uses to pay in silver and gold. Not surprisingly, President Trump also supports a gold standard. Reyes Penny Stock Connection 9 was with the Joseph Pia law firm. Reyes was off counsel with the firm. Joseph Pia, on behalf of his company, Incentive Capital, had sued a Hollywood penny stock company, Camelot Entertainment Group. The settlement resulted in Pia getting Incentive Capital's Liberation Film Library, purportedly worth about $4 million. Camelot Entertainment had been accused of committing securities fraud. Its stock price had dropped below one cent. 
Camelot Entertainment, over-the-counter stock trading was suspended. Incentive Capital is also now defunct. I saved Reyes's 10th penny stock connection, his strongest for last. It was with Alan Crooks, his closest confidant. Out of BYU, Crooks began work at the Stuart James brokerage, then the nation's largest brokerage for penny stock trades. They called them investment bankers. They were actually boiler room cold call penny stock telemarketers. Crooks was licensed as a broker in 1989 and again in 1993 in the fraud-ridden, over-the-counter stock profession. Stuart James, where Crooks worked, was shuttered in 1990. Securities and Exchange Commission attorney Robert Fussfeld called Denver-based Stuart James one of the biggest and most notorious penny stock dealers. It had $100 million in annual revenue and 50 branch offices at its peak, defrauding more than 6,000 customers. Stuart James presented a catalog of the worst abuses of the penny stock era that is now behind us, Fussfeld said. The record clearly shows this was nothing but a factory for fraud. Utah politicians' involvement with penny stocks is not new. I'll talk about two examples, Bill Brune, a Democrat, and Carl Snow, a Republican. Bill Brune, a Democrat, was director of community affairs under former Governor Calvin Rampton. Brune and his employee, Michael Strand, were accused in 1976 of selling penny stocks to state employees while on government time. The stocks were Northwest Pacific Enterprises and Hi Ho Silver, both alleged securities frauds. The story was widely covered by most major Utah media outlets. Rod Decker, who was with Deseret News at the time, wrote that Strand spent much of his time as a state employee following stock prices and touting speculative stock. Brune was asked to resign in 1977. Carl Snow, a Republican, was a 1990 candidate in Utah's 3rd Congressional District. He was a Harvard business graduate, a former Utah State Senator, and a BYU Vice President. He purchased penny stocks from previously convicted swindler Michael Strand. Yes, the same Mike Strand I just mentioned. He was an officer and director of Unique Battery Systems. Snow testified on Strand's behalf when Strand was tried and convicted again that was for a second time in 1987 for securities fraud. The controversy included a 1987 investor suicide, a 1988 firebombing of Strand's house, and a polygamous promoter of unique battery stock. Bill Orton, the Democrat, upset Snow in the election. In mid-October, Snow had held a 50 to 35 percent lead over Orton, with 12 percent undecided. Snow's penny stock tie was the most reported campaign news down the stretch. The GOP called it a smear campaign. Even so, Snow lost. Stephen Stuttered had been Carl Snow's campaign manager. Stuttered had been an advisor to Presidents Reagan, Ford, and Bush. Carl Snow's campaign killing penny stock misadventures did not scare off his campaign chairman, Stuttert, from diving into his own penny stock ventures. After working on Snow's campaign, Stuttert helped form Phonics Corporation using a reverse merger with a penny stock shell company. Phonics lost more than $100 million while its founders got rich. Since Phonic, more penny stock ventures. Canyon Gold, formed in 1998, and Defense Technology Corporation. In conclusion, back to the question. Utah penny stock fraud, is it back or did it ever leave? It never left. Utah news media quit covering it. Utah law enforcement quit prosecuting it. And Utah continues to be a sanctuary, a protected haven for penny stock swindlers.